My name is Jeremy. I'm the lead pastor here. I want to welcome those also watching online. We're studying through the book of Acts, one of the books in the New Testament that is so uh, foundational to our faith because it tells how the church began and it also gives us a model to follow. So what we're doing in this series is looking at how we are to be the church by looking at the first church. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up with me to Acts chapter 4. You'll also see this on the side screens as well. Short passage, but um, really, really good stuff here in Acts chapter 4. I thought we'd look at it before we move on to the next chapter in this series. And so verse 32 says this. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold." and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Verse 36, thus Joseph, who was also called the apostles, uh, by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. You know what's cool about this passage is it's in the Bible, I think that's neat that God actually included that story of Joseph and how the early church was generous. That tells me, and it should tell you, that God wants us to know as we seek to be the church that he wants us to be, that we should be a generous church. Why? Because the early church was a generous church. God wants us to know that the early church was a generous church. But they didn't really seek out to be a generous church. What were they doing? If you read through the book of Acts, They're just following Jesus. They're being led by his spirit. They're following Jesus, trying to be disciples of Jesus. And as a result of being a disciple of Jesus and watching how Jesus was, they became generous. Which makes sense, right? Jesus was generous. He said things like, um, it's more blessed to give than to what? Receive. You've heard that before. You probably know it's true. If you've ever given a gift at Christmas time or a gift to your son or daughter during their birthday, you know it just feels good when you give something to another person. Jesus was on to something. He says it's more blessed to give than to receive. We, we kind of live in a culture like they did back then where you know you got to look out for number one. I got I got to get mines, they used to say in Hebrew. I don't know how they said it in Hebrew, but we say the same thing. I got to get mine. I got to look out for me, myself, and I. And Jesus comes along and says, no, there's actually a better way. There's actually a better way. It's more blessed to give than to receive. He said things like, rather than store up for yourself treasures on earth, which is what we tend to focus on in our culture, he said, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Because heaven is a lot longer, like eternity is a lot longer than this temporal, materialistic culture that we we find ourselves in. Rather than focus on the temporal, he says to focus on the eternal. He said, freely have you received, therefore you should freely give. That that comes from Jesus. And, And so to be a Christian, to follow Jesus means to recognize all that you've been forgiven of, all that you've been blessed with, and as a result of that, you would live a lifestyle of generosity. And so that's how the church became known as the generous church. And what we see in Acts, what we see in Acts chapter 4, simply is a result of these early believers following Jesus. 
which when you look at you know, the church today compared to what you're reading in the book of Acts, if you kind of read through the whole book, you, you see kind of a slightly different picture, don't you? It's kind of sad when you look at the early church and then you look at the modern church of America today especially. Um, in fact, this, this morning I came across an article on, I think it was on Relevant, Relevant Magazine, but there, there was also a link to churchleaders.com. The title of the article intrigued me. This is the name of the, the, the title of the article. What would happen if the church tithed? How giving 10% could change the world. It's interesting. Um, if you're new to church, maybe new to Christianity, tithe simply means tenth. So when we tithe, we're, we're, we're giving hopefully the first tenth of what God has given us back to him because we recognize that it's all his. And so that first 10% is just a way to say, thank you, God, for all that you've done for me. So think about that. What if the church actually tithed, how 10% could change the world. So it intrigued me. I started reading it. And um, I was a little shocked by some of the statistics that I read, a little surprised. Um, For example, one of the things that the article said, this is a research, I'm not sure actually how they, they, they did it, but they said that in the average American church today, only 10 to 25% of churchgoers actually tithe. 10 to 25%. So this is in America. This is the people who actually attend church, which I know there's people that are followers of Jesus who don't go to church, okay? And so this is just in the church. That means 75 to 90% of the people don't tithe, don't don't give it a 10%. That was interesting. The other thing that just blew me away, get this. If you know our country's history, in the Great Depression, the average American Christian gave 3.3% of their income. 3.3%. Compare that to today, where the average American Christian statistics tell us they give 2.5%. I read that, and I'm like, what's wrong with that picture? Like, I mean, how is it that Christians in the Great Depression gave more back then than we do on average today? That's, that's kind of interesting. And then the article goes on to say what would actually happen if, if we all tithe. Get this, an additional $165 billion would be available for missions, ministry, care of the poor and the sick. Can I, can I say that again? $165 billion. You say, what, what would I do with $165 billion? Well, here's what you could do. The, the article answers it. You could actually stamp out world hunger in five years. They say it would take about $25 billion. Different factors, I'm not sure. You'd have to plant and you know, resource and all that stuff. But $25 billion to end world hunger in five years. Not 10, not 25, not you know, at the end of your lifetime. Five years. If people actually tithe and, you know, basically did what God had already told them to do and had those additional resources. Here's another one. Uh, illiteracy, huge in the world. With 12 billion, 12 of that billion, 12 of that $165 billion, we could end illiteracy in five years. Be amazing. Here, here's another one. Um, 15 billion could solve all the world's water and sanitation problems. Just show of hands at all of our locations. How many of you took a shower this morning? Just go ahead and lie. Just get, just get your hands up. I took a shower this morning. Uh, I actually did. And, and, and the water, I'm so thankful, the water I'm drinking out of this cup is clear, right? It's not brown. <laughs> Aren't you thankful that your water is not brown? But do you realize that for the majority, there's a huge population in our world, they don't even have access to clean water. Can't take a clean shower. Can't drink clean water. And, and uh, 15 billion, if we had more resources to actually stamp that out, it, it would be taken care of. Um, the Great Commission, where Jesus says to go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Go to the nations, right? We see that in Acts. It's starting to spread and spread and spread. Well, it takes money to do that. It takes resources to do that. It takes, it takes resources to send out those workers. That's why we give to the Great Commission Fund through the Christian and Missionary Alliance to help support those people. One billion. I said one billion out of that 165 billion would fully fund the Great 
Commission or fully fund um, Great Commission resources. Isn't that amazing? If we imagine what could happen if the church, the average American Christian, would simply do what God had asked them to do already. What's amazing when you read through the book of Acts, that was happening. Like it wasn't abnormal. It was the norm for a believer in the early church to give generously, to not be greedy, to not, to not hold on to things so that they would store up for themselves treasures on earth, but to freely give it away so that there was no need among them. And one of the reasons is they didn't focus on the material stuff. They knew that Jesus was coming back, and that very fact alone influenced the way they gave. Do you realize that, that it said they had one heart and one mind, right? One heart, one mind, and as a result, they helped the people that were in their body. They helped the people that were in their family. And the reason why they did is because they felt the need. They felt that family's pain. They felt that individual's hardship. So much so, they said, that can't happen. I'm going to meet your need. I'm going to do something about that. They knew each other. They were a part of each other, and therefore, they helped each other, and there was no need among them. That's why the scripture says, no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as the owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. You know, I was thinking about that. You know, I told you guys it'd be a good resource for you to buy, like a scripture journal where you, you have the passage on one side and then you could write different things on, on the other side. And I was thinking about it, you know, where, where I read that passage, what if that same passage was written by God today? Like, that's all Luke was doing here in Acts. He was basically getting a, a narrative of what was happening in the early church. What he saw, what he heard, he would write down. It was, it was history, you know? What if history was written about the, the church today? How would it read? It might go something like this. Um, the believers were pretty selfish, actually, and uh, the church wasn't all that generous. In fact, they fought a lot after church, and as a result, there was a lot of need in the church. They didn't help each other. In fact, they sold their possessions and kept the money so that they could buy more stuff. It would probably read something like that, right? And I, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer completely, but isn't that a pretty accurate picture when we hear and see what is happening? in the American church, the average American church. Well, guess what? We're not average. That's not us. And it can't be us. It won't be us. It wasn't this guy Joseph either. Joseph, what did he do? This guy Joseph, he owns a field. Maybe it was an inheritance. Maybe it was left in his family. Maybe his kids are like, can I have that, Dad? Can we get some of that money too, you know? And he's like, listen, if there's so much need... And God, you've given me this. Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord and everything in it. Then why would I not give it all back to you for the purpose of your kingdom? He didn't, you know, he didn't have to give any of it, right? He could have given 10%. He could have doubled that, given 20%. But he gives it all so that all could have their needs met. What's so cool about that story? Joseph, random guy, right? Just... Luke throws it in there, random guy. He becomes the model for how we as a church should be generous. Um, I heard this question one time that, that really challenged me, and hopefully it'll challenge everybody, but it goes like this. If everyone, if everyone gave like me, what kind of church would we be? If everyone gave like me, what kind of church would we be? You'd have to answer that yourself. And maybe the answer to that question, if you were Joseph, if you'd be like, we'd be a pretty cool church, right? All the needs would be met. Everybody would be selling their fields and their houses and their stuff to provide for everybody in need. For some of us, the answer to that question would be, pretty good church. I mean, pretty good church. Feel good about that. For others, we might have to shut the power off, you know? <laughs> might not have church if everyone gave like me. What kind of church would we be if everyone gave like me. And there's a reason why in the early church there was no needy people among them. And that was because there was no greed among the people. Where, where there's no greed, there's no need. 
Everybody's heart beats together. They're at one. They have the, the same mission. They have the same mindset. They're one body. And so they were so generous with what God has blessed them with. Um, the reason we want to be a church who's generous is one of our core values. If you look over here at all of our locations, these banners, in case you're new to Crosstown, these are our core values. We call them our DNA. And one of the core values in our church is we are generous with God's resources. It reads, we will, be sac- we will give sacrificially to the work of God in our communities. That's what we want to be as a church because we recognize that all of what we have is God's and what we need to do is become a steward of what God has given to us. We are generous with his resources. And the cool thing, this is happening in our church. This is happening in our church. Can I give you a couple updates? Um, one is something they called our, our Helping Hands Fund. It used to be called the Provident Fund or, or the Benevolent Fund where people could give um, extra, you know, above and beyond their normal giving to kind of help specific tangible needs that come up uh, in the church so that we can just, like, hear about something and meet it. We used to have, like, you know, this whole committee where if I heard about a need, this is like years ago, I'd hear about a need and then I would have to call like three individuals who had their own jobs and it was like complicated thing. It wasn't very streamlined. It wasn't very fast. Now what we've done is um, we've switched it from the Provident Fund. We call it the Helping Hands Fund. I like that name. And all the campus pastors are basically, they serve on that committee, okay? So when we hear about a need in the church, when we hear about a need in the community, um, they get on the phone with one another and say, hey, you know, let's look at how much we have. Let's look at how much the church has given. Can we meet this need? And they all say, yep, let's do it. And over and over again, because of your guys' generosity at all the locations, it's been, yep, let's do it. Yep, let's do it. So l- let me give you some examples. $300 recently was given to a family with uh, vehicle trouble. Couldn't afford to fix their vehicle. They, didn't, they only had one vehicle. And so they, we gave them $300 to fix the vehicle vehicle because if you don't have a vehicle you don't you can't get to your job and if you can't get to your job you have no job okay so that that's huge you guys were able to help with that here's another one five hundred dollars was given to a family to get a medical test done for their son that needed to to be done they couldn't afford it five hundred dollars for a medical exam and so we as a church stepped in and paid for that bill so that their son could get this medical test done cool is that you guys are that church being generous with god's resources um, $200 was given to buy a refrigerator uh, for a family that was in need. You got an old refrigerator. How many of you are thankful for a working refrigerator? How many of you know it stinks when your refrigerator goes bad? You can get all the stuff out, put it in your cooler. We were able to step in and help this family who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford a new refrigerator. Um, $300 was given to pay for someone's rent who lost, they recently lost their job. How are you going to pay for your rent when you lose your job? We were able to step in as a church and meet that need because of your generosity. Isn't that cool? I mean, you could celebrate if you want or sit there like you're bored, but my goodness. Come on now. That's cool. That's good. That's the church. Um, Two weeks ago, maybe I think it was two weeks ago, we were in Acts chapter 2. I was talking about how the early church um, met each other's needs, and um, they had such a good reputation with their community. They had favor with all the people, is I think the exact phrase that Acts chapter 2 uses. They had favor with all the people. Because of how they loved one another, people saw that, and it made such a huge impact. And so the end of that sermon, if you remember, I challenged all the campuses. This is like um, probably six weeks ago. I told the campus pastors, this is what I'm preaching on. It's up to you guys to find a need. Uh, Let me know what you got. And so three out of the four uh, campus pastors came back to me and then presented to you guys, only in Arcade and Wellsville, and said, we're going to partner with an uh, unplanned pregnancy center in our community. Um, Bright Alternatives is in Wellsville and Bradford, so only in Wellsville campus partnered with them. And then Choices in Arcade, uh, they have uh, one of those facilities as well. Different organization, but they do the same thing. They provide resources, diapers, cribs, counseling for these, uh, for these mothers, um, helping them make wise decisions, which is so important. And so what we did was partner with them. Remember the baby bottles? We had you guys fill change and uh, dollar bills. We challenged everybody to give $10 towards that. So three out of our four campuses did that. Last week, you guys brought them in. You ready for this total? Normally, I got to tell you this, normally they say you should do it for five weeks. When you get the baby bottles, 
give it to your congregation, give it to your organization for five weeks and then let them put a dime in each week. It'll just take forever. I said, no, no, we don't need to do that. You don't know our church. We don't, we don't need to do that. We're going to challenge them one week. In one week, three out of the four campuses raised $4,700. Isn't that awesome? That's, that's awesome. Praise God for that. So there's a cool story behind that. Um, and, and kudos to the Olean campus. Out of that $4,700, um, $2,961 came from the Olean campus. And here's the cool story about that. Um, they had so many bottles brought to Olean. Pastor Andy had to carry them to the, to the Bright Alternatives location. He almost pulled out his back. They were so heavy, which I picked up one this morning. Someone brought it here. They're, they're heavy. If you got a bunch of change in the, those bottles, they're, they're really heavy. So he's bringing them all to this location, and she was just shocked. She's like, this is what you've raised in one week? She couldn't believe it. It was the largest donation that they had gotten from one organization. And he's like, what do you mean, in one week? She's like, no. No matter what we, how many weeks you had it, this is the largest. She was shocked. She couldn't believe it. And then she told Pastor Andy that the day, I think it was the day before he called. So I told him this on a Tuesday staff meeting. I said, you guys got to better, you better get on the phone and to do this. He called on Wednesday. Well, the day before Wednesday, Tuesday, as I was sharing this with the campus pastors, they learned that they had a, they just learned of a huge deficit that they had in their budget uh, that they needed to make up. And the director said, I don't, this is so big, I don't know how we're going to even make this up, like, but, but they didn't reach out to anybody. They just said, God's got this, God's going to provide. And Pastor Andy called the very next day and said, hey, can we do this? And you guys stepped up. $4,700 was raised to help unplanned pregnancies, to give counseling to these, to these mothers, to give diapers, resources. That's the church. That's being a generous church. You get an amen for that. Amen. And then, and then uh, our Shingle House campus didn't do that. They, they did something else because recently, uh, unfortunately, a, um, uh, a lady, a woman in the Shingle House community, her house burnt down. I don't know if I shared this last week, but the, her house is like destroyed by fri fire. And so she was living in her truck, I believe is what uh, Pastor Tim told me. She was living in her truck. This is like when we had that freezing cold weather. And Tim heard of it, Pastor Tim heard of it, and said, we got to do something. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to meet a need uh, from, from your sermon a couple of weeks ago. I said, cool. So they didn't do the baby bottles. They just encouraged their people to give. Give money, give, if you want to donate appliances, clothing, food. So they donated at Shingle House over $1,000, and they brought in microwave, TV, clothing, a fridge, electrical, uh, and building work that they provided at that, at that place. Isn't that cool? They're delivering it today at 2 o'clock. They're going to show up to this lady's door you know, probably a good, good number of them, too, with Pastor Tim, and they're going to not, you know, show up to this lady's place where she's staying and then just give her all this stuff. Isn't that cool? That's the church being the church. I, you know, I, I was thinking about that, and I was reminded of what Paul said to the Corinth church, church at Corinth. Um, keep in mind, this is, you know, Acts starts to spread, and we're going to get there, but the apostle Paul starts planting all these churches. Well, this generosity that you read in Acts chapter 4 starts spreading, it becomes contagious that other churches are starting to do this. So this is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, this is God, this is what God does, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So this is Paul writing to a church, and he wants this church to know, and he wants our church to know, that the reason why we're blessed, the reason why we're, if you can go back to the previous verse there, guys, in verse 11, the reason why we're enriched in every way is why? To be generous in every way. Paul wants us to know the reason why you're blessed is to be a blessing, and if you live in America, you're rich compared to the world. 
Everybody in here is richer than the majority of the world. We have resources that other people don't have. And, 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 and God would look at us as a church and say, the reason why Crosstown is blessed, the reason why people are given, the reason why you have these resources is not to just pat, your, pat yourself on the back, but to be a blessing to other people and to meet those needs of those, of those people in our community and in our church. And he says, when that happens, when we keep hearing these stories of, of people's needs being met, when that happens, not only will, will change lives happen. You imagine how this lady is going to feel when Pastor Tim shows up at her, at her place with you know, a TV and a refrigerator and clothes and food and a check. And you imagine how she's going to feel. Not only will that happen, but Paul also says, if you go back to the, the very last verse, verse 12, it says, that it will also be overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. In other words, it's not just about other people being helped. It's also about our relationship with God, that it's an act of worship. Do you ever think about giving as an act of worship? You ever wonder why we have an offering at the end of the worship service, not just kind of like a separate thing, like we're done, now we're going to do this thing. It's, it's all one thing because it's an offering. You're offering back worship to God as a way to say thank you, recognizing as Psalm 21, 24, 1 says that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, everything that you have is God's. He doesn't need any money, right? I think people get caught up with that, like the church is just after my money or God's just after my money. Can I just tell you that God's doing pretty well for himself? He, he wants me to tell you that he had a really good year last year, okay? And if he ever has a down year, the Bible also says the streets are paved with what? So if he gets in trouble, if he gets in a jam, he can just sell some sidewalk and be set, okay, for eternity. He's okay. He doesn't need our money, but he does want our hearts. He does want our hearts. He wants our hearts to be thankful. And giving is a natural thing that flows out of gratitude. Giving always flows out of gratitude. So, church, a few... few um, Food for thoughts, next steps, questions for reflection. Um, you'll see these on the screen. I want you to spend some time this week, this today, thanking God for all the ways that he's blessed you in your life. Do we do that on a regular basis? Maybe you do that before you eat, you give thanks because the food that you are about to partake was given to you by God. Could we do the same thing? Can we say grace before we take a shower? Can we say grace before we get into our beds? Can we say grace as we're warm inside when the snow is falling outside? It's a way of saying thanks because everything that was given to you was given to you by God. Perhaps that act of gratitude will produce in you this characteristic that we see in the early church of generosity. Here's another one. Ask yourself, am I trusting God with every area of my life, including my finances? You know, we like to think that we're trusting God, but when, we, when it comes down to it, money and, money and resources and finances are really near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. That's why Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So ask the question, you're, you're trusting God with a lot of other things in your life, but are you trusting him with every area of your life, including your finances? Number three, is there anything more I could be doing for God's kingdom? Is there anything else I could be giving back to God? Maybe that question was asked at the early church, and Joseph's like, I got a field, you know? I got a field, and someone else said, I got a house. I told the Wellsville campus this before, I'm, I'm sure plenty of times, but maybe not everybody at all of our, our locations. Um, our previous church was awesome at this. We, we, we love being a part of that church because that church was so generous. The people were so generous with their resources that when the time that we left, this was like nine years ago, at the time of our leaving, there was 19 get this, 19 cars given to other people in the church. So rather than selling their car, and there's nothing wrong with this, but a lot of people sell their car, take that cash, put a down payment on a bigger, nicer vehicle. These people were just like, no, I can afford a car. You need a car. Here's a car. Happened to us 19 times. That was nine years ago. Who knows how many cars they've given away in their church. It just became contagious that people, that became the norm. I think that's what happened in the early church. It just became the norm. Uh, Joseph's giving his field away. I guess I got, I'm going to give my field away too. Everybody's giving their fields away, right? It became contagious, and so people just started giving. Imagine if that was our church, that you would take whatever resources you have. might not be your field. 
You might not have a field. You might not have a, an extra house. You might not have a car to be able to give away, but you've got something to give. You've got clothes to give. You've got some food to give. You've got some resources to give. What could you give that could help other people? What, what are you not giving that could be an asset, a resource for the kingdom of God? And then finally, is there anyone I could bless this week for the glory of God? Is there anyone else I could bless this week for the glory of God? My hope um, as I was writing this message is that, that God's spirit would prompt someone in your heart right now, prompt someone in your mind right now, and that you would be obedient to that prompting. And then this week, go do it. Tell me about it. It'd be cool to hear a bunch of stories of how God used that. But I think the tendency we often have a lot of times is prompt, and then you try to rationalize. That, that was just the pizza I ate last night. That wasn't God. You know, It just seems irrational. God, I know you're seeing the big picture and all, but you're kind of missing some details. I don't have that, and this, uh, that might not be good timing. God's like, no, you just need to be obedient. Maybe God would prompt you to, to, to uh, bless someone this week. You know, it's sad, I mentioned this earlier, but it's sad, I think a lot of Christians in the American church are, are living with, I've got to get mine first type of mentality. And you don't see that mentality in the early church. They're, they're living with a closed fist approach to life. Okay? So here's what I want you to do. At all of our locations, I want you to hold out your hands. Clench your fists. No open hands right now, just clench fists. Imagine if God came over to you right now and wanted to pour out so much blessing in your life. Could he do it? Imagine if I came over right now, Tom, and I had a huge bucket of coins, right? And I wanted, it's not always money that there's blessing, but there's all, all kinds of blessings, relational blessings, health blessings, money blessings sometimes. But I wanted to pour out a bunch of coins onto your hands right now. You put them together, you got clothes finished. Can you do it? it's all going to fall to the floor. And, and the sad reality is when we're, when we're holding on to our stuff with clenched fists, the problem is we're positioning our hands to never receive all that is his. So let me ask you, would you rather have all that's yours or would you rather have all that God has to offer you? Are you living with clenched fists are you living with open hands? Because not only will you get blessed, but that will overflow into other people's lives and they will get blessed as well. Are you gripping on like it's all yours? Or are you giving like it's all his? Are you living your life with clenched fists or open hands? I can tell you without any doubt that all the number of the believers, as Acts chapter 4 just said, were living with one heart and one mind like this. Not like this. Let's be that church. Let's continue to be that church. We are that church. We are generous with God's resources. We will continue to meet the needs of this church and the people around us. Let me pray for us. I'm going to invite the worship teams to come forward as we close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would um, embed this message deep down in our hearts, that we would grow in this area of giving, as the Bible says, excel in the gift of giving. And so I, I pray, Lord, that we would take whatever resources that you've entrusted to us and be stewards of them so that people's needs could be met. Help us do that as a church. And when, when I say church, I pray that you would remind your people that the church is us. Too many people say, well, I wish the church would do this. I wish the church would help with this person. They should meet that need, and it's really us. If we are going to be a generous church, Lord, we need to be generous people. So I pray that uh, as you give us opportunities, as you prompt us to bless other people that need help, that you would give us faith to step into that opportunity and bless those who need it. Help us look more and more like this generous church that we read about in Acts, specifically what we hear about in Acts chapter 4. And it's in your precious name we ask this. Amen.